The Continued Pipe Dream is a story from the collection Strange Stories, from a Chinese studio written by the Qing Dynasty novelist Pu Songling. It mainly narrates the tale of a Fujian candidate named Zheng Hu, after passing the imperial examination, strolls around the suburbs of the capital with a few fellow scholars. They encounter a fortune teller in a temple who predicts that Zheng will become a prime minister for 20 years. Later, Zheng dreams a dream in a temple, leading to a series of dramatic events in his life. It is said that in Fujian, there was a candidate named Zheng Hu, upon passing the imperial examination, went on a leisurely stroll in the suburbs of the capital with a couple of fellow scholars from the same year. They heard of a fortune teller residing in a Buddhist temple and decided to visit him for a divination. Upon entering the room, they greeted the fortune teller and sat down. The fortune teller noticed Zheng's confident demeanor and flattered him a bit. With a smile, Zheng asked the fortune teller, Do I have the fortune to wear the dragon robe and a jade belt? The fortune teller replied in all seriousness, You are destined to be a peaceful prime minister for 20 years. Delighted, Zheng felt even more self-assured. As a light rain started outside, they took shelter in a monk's room. There was an old monk present, with deep-set eyes and a high nose, who sat quietly on a cushion. They exchanged greetings and sat on a bed, referring to Zheng as the Prime Minister and expressing their congratulations. In high spirits, Zheng pointed at one of his companions and exclaimed, When I become Prime Minister, I'll recommend Zhang Mianzhang for the position of Governor of Nanjing. My distant relatives can be appointed as generals or officers. Even our old servants can become minor officials. That would fulfill my aspiration. Laughter filled the room. After a while, the rain intensified. Feeling tired, Zheng lay down on the bed. Suddenly, he saw the palace messengers delivering a decree from the emperor, summoning him as the grand preceptor to discuss state affairs. Zheng was elated and quickly followed the messengers to the imperial palace. The emperor greeted him kindly and discussed matters at length, promising that officials below the third rank would be under his jurisdiction for appointments without needing imperial approval. He bestowed upon Zheng a dragon robe, a jade belt, and valuable horses. Zheng knelt and expressed gratitude before leaving the court. Upon returning home, he found his residence transformed into a magnificent palace with elaborate carvings and decorations. He couldn't comprehend the sudden change, but noticed that his servants were prompt and attentive as he summoned them. Notably, the level of deference varied according to his status. Before long, officials and ministers, including the six ministries and three courts, began submitting memorials in Peqing Zhang. Even those who had previously flattered him turned against him. The emperor ordered the confiscation of his wealth and his exile to Yunnan. Zhang's son, serving as the prefect of Pingyang in Shaanxi, was also summoned to the capital for questioning. Frightened by the news, Zheng was grateful that the emperor chose not to act upon the memorials that implicated him. However, more memorials continued to arrive, and the atmosphere turned hostile. One day, Zheng encountered a drunken man on the main road, who collided with his procession. Zheng ordered his men to apprehend the man, and he was promptly executed. Wealthy neighbors and landowners, who had previously sought his favor surrendered their properties and fertile lands to him out of fear his wealth rival that of a king. Zheng reflected on his past deeds and found all his desires fulfilled. A year later, rumors of conspiracies against him circulated in the court. Despite his haughty attitude, Zheng realized that the dissent was substantial. Suddenly, a senior official, Bo Gong, submitted a bold memorial impeaching Zheng. The memorial accused him of being a corrupt and despotic ruler who oppressed the people and abused power. The emperor didn't punish Zheng, but the complaints continued, ultimately leading to his downfall. Overcome with fear, Zheng's fortunes dramatically changed. His properties were confiscated, and his wife was arrested. The process was swift, leaving him devastated and powerless. Mr. Zheng and his wife set out with tears in their eyes. They requested a worn-out cart pulled by an old horse for transportation, but the officers in charge refused. After walking 10 miles, Mrs. Zheng's feet grew weak, and she was about to fall. Mr. Zheng supported her with his hands. After another 10 miles, he himself became exhausted. Suddenly, 
they saw a high mountain ahead, piercing the sky, and they worried about how to climb it. They wept together while helping each other, all the while facing the ferocious glares of the guards who urged them forward without respite. As the sun began to set, and with no place to rest for the night, they had no choice but to continue walking, hunched over, taking one step at a time. When they were halfway up the mountain, Mrs. Zheng was too weak to go on and sat by the roadside crying. Mr. Zheng sat down to rest as well, despite the scolding of the officers. Suddenly, they heard shouts from a group of people. A gang of robbers was chasing after them with sharp knives and guns. The guards who were escorting them were terrified and fled. Mr. Zheng knelt on the ground, saying, I, though guilty, still hold an official position in the court. How dare you, a bunch of thugs, act recklessly, the leader of the robbers angrily retorted. We are innocent people who have been wronged. We only want your head, nothing else. Enraged, Mr. Zheng reprimanded them, but the robbers swung their huge axes and beheaded him. He felt his head hit the ground with a thud. Soon, two little demons appeared, bound his hands, and led him away. After a few hours, they reached a big city. Before long, they came across a palace where an ugly-looking Yama, the king of hell, sat on a long desk, making judgments about the fate of souls. Mr. Zheng rushed forward, prostrating himself and begging for mercy. Yama looked through the scrolls briefly and furiously proclaimed, This is a crime of deceiving the emperor and harming the country. He should be thrown into the boiling oil. Countless ghosts in the hall echoed his words like thunder. A giant ghost seized Mr. Zheng, threw him under the boiling oil pot, and he felt his body tumble in the boiling oil. His skin and flesh burnt, and the pain was excruciating. He thought death would come soon, but he realized there was no escape. After what felt like a meal's worth of time, a giant ghost used a large iron fork to take him out of the pot and forced him to kneel again. Yama inspected the records and angrily stated, he used his power for evil, bullied others, and must be sent to the mountain of swords and knives. The ghost dragged him to a mountain with sharp, intertwining blades that had impaled several people's intestines. Cries of agony filled the air. The ghost urged Mr. Zhang to climb up, but he recoiled in fear, causing a ministerial ghost to stab his head with a poisonous skewer. Begging for mercy, he was thrown into the air. He felt himself plummeting through the clouds, the sharp blades piercing his chest. After a while, he fell off the blades, and the giant ghost brought him back to Yama. Yama calculated the wealth Mr. Zheng had accumulated through corruption and bribery, and ordered him to drink the molten gold and silver. With the gold piled up like a small hill, it was melted in a fiery furnace. Ghosts poured the molten metal down his throat, causing him excruciating pain. Yama then sent him to be reincarnated as a beggar's daughter in Gansu, China. She suffered hunger and wore ragged clothes as she begged on the streets. Eventually, she was sold as a concubine to a scholar named Gu. She enjoyed a harsh life, facing cruelty from the scholar's wife and harassment from a neighbor. She was falsely accused of murdering her husband and sentenced to a brutal death. In the depths of her despair, a friend's voice woke her up from her nightmare. She realized it was all a dream and was left in awe of the old monk's divination. She learned the importance of cultivating virtue and realized that even in difficult circumstances, a righteous path could lead to spiritual growth. All right, this story has come to an end. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Thank you.